I'm, I'm going to talk about how you can look at how natural processes and natural systems operate to give you the diversity and the, uh, the um, well, the diversity that you need in a reservoir area. And so looking at, uh, say, topographic heterogeneity, um, we have these vast areas that, uh, that are very limited in terms of diversity. Um, and the reed canary grasses uh, may control dust, but that is about all it does for us. I wanted to give you a brief example from, uh, from the Heber Dam project that I was involved with a few years ago. Basically, it was a wooden dam that was 50 years old, so they needed to, BC Hydro needed to do something about it. And so they decided that it wasn't worth rebuilding it because they weren't getting enough power from it. And there was also a uh, need to reestablish the rivers the way they had formerly been. And so, uh, so they took the dam out, and I was asked to restore the site. <clears throat> it was a penstock, uh, three kilometers long. And so we made it all rough and loose, um, which is my term for topographic heterogeneity. It's much easier to, to remember. Um, and covered it with woody debris, as you see here. So it, it looks like a mess. But in terms of uh, biological uh, viability, it's, uh, it's great. Did a bunch of monitoring. So we put, set up transects, five different transects in different project locations uh, with 10 plots on each. So we had 50 plots. And that's what it looked like, this, uh, the dam area. Uh, earlier this summer. The woody debris was an important part because what, uh, what it does is it brings in the uh, birds, which then poop out the seeds of the uh, fruit-bearing plants. Turns out we've got um, fruit-bearing plants in 90% of the plots. So 40 out of the 50, no, more than that. 90% anyways, 45 out of the 50 plots. We've got, uh, uh, the, you know, thimbleberry and, and salmonberry and, and those fruit-bearing plants. And that's because the birds have brought that in. And so if you think about that, that's a natural process. I didn't have to plant those plants on the site. They just were there because the, I put the woody debris there right a place for the birds to perch on, and they brought in the seeds of the, uh, of the fruit-bearing plants. The same is true of the rough and loose conditions. It creates the conditions that allows vegetation to establish. So the first year, we had 5,400 stems per hectare of alder that moved in, right? And uh, none of these were planted. They're, granted, they're you know, they're small little seedlings, but uh, no, nonetheless, they were there. Even between the riprap uh, along the river. So uh, important to have vegetation in riprap because it locks it in place and, uh, and prevents the stones of the riprap from moving and basically provides riparian habitat as well, which is a lot better than just the, the bare riprap. Second year, we went up to 8,500 stems per hectare, uh, along with 67 other species. So lots of lots of activity. Um, and the third year, we were back down to 5,400 um, stems per hectare. And this is what it looked like with the, uh, the alder growing up, along with 80 other species. This, this year, and this, in case you didn't see it, see that, that site? This is that same site a year later. So this was uh, this summer, and we had 6,100, 6,162 alder, um, and conifers in 80% of the plots. None of these were planted. They all came in 
naturally bite because I created the right conditions for them. And so if we look at a, a single site, and you can see the, uh, the tree there that's sort of bent that is identifiable. Um, this is what it looked like in 2013. When I was doing my transects, you can see the uh, shovel and the plot stake there. 2014, just starting to be able to see the alder showing up. 2015, this was early this year before the leaves came out. And you can see it's still the you know, same ground. But in the summer, with the leaves on, you know, so, it, you know, by creating a diversity of habitats, um, you can create a diversity of conditions for vegetation growth. I was very interested. I was uh, um, over in France a couple weeks ago um, at the Eco Summit, and one of the things that we did as a field trip was went to the delta of the Rhone River, um, right on the uh, on the Mediterranean coast, and. Uh, um, one of the things that, that's happening there is this mound creation associated with the water flowing and um, the, uh, the vegetation establishing. So the vegetation is trapping sediments, creating these mounds, and then the mounds are really very diverse. Um, in fact, ver you know, that's where the vegetation is occurring. So it's, it's in essence, it's the same ecological process that we're talking about. So can we use the excess woody debris, this is what Virgil was talking about, um, and a lack of high elevation sites to create uh, diversity in reservoir bottoms? So there are some problems that we encounter with, the, with trying to revegetate reservoirs. I was out yesterday looking at the site just down here at Burton, and uh, reed canary grass is all through it. What, how do you deal with reed canary grass? Well, this is a project that I was involved in um, trying to um, reestablish this lovely little um, plant here called woolly heads. Um, and it formerly it occupied a huge, quite a large area, and there were literally millions of the plants. It's a red-listed species, uh, considered endangered by Kosiwek. Um, you know, so there, there is an emphasis to try and save it. Unfortunately, the, uh, the um, municipality dredged the creek because they were getting concerns from the farmer upstream that, uh, that the water wasn't draining fast enough. Of course, dredging the creek didn't change the rate at which the water flowed out, right? It's only so much grade on that creek, and it just doesn't flow out that quick. But what they did was they built, they inadvertently built a berm along the edge of the creek and prevented the flooding of the area that the tall woolly heads grew, grew in. And so that caused the demise of that area. Um, willows and, and reed canary grass moved in, and so it was this big, bushy area. That, uh, that occupied the, habit the former habitat of the, of the tall woolly heads. And we were down to only a few plants in that area found. So we chopped up all the, the woody vegetation, got rid of it all, and the reed canary grass. So that was in 2013. That's what it looked like after we finished brush cutting. And, you know, it, it looks like a disaster, but uh, we actually brought in a, an excavator to breach the, the berm. So you see there's a breach there and there's a breach down there. And habitat for the tall woolly heads was the bare soil. It floods, and uh, because the, the creek is, is right there, so it floods 
we built the berm the breaches to be the elevation of the creek during normal conditions and so during high water it actually floods and we get it flooded in the winter time you can see the stumps of the willows right, coming up so you know you've got the same stumps of the willows the vegetation starting to regrow in terms of you know of course what happens when you cut off a willow right you chop down a willow you get a million suckers coming up so um, the same is true with with reed canary grass you chop up chop down the re reed canary grass and a million new suckers new plants come up and so that's what we were faced with we wanted to identify where the uh, where the tall woolly heads were so we wouldn't uh, harm them so that's what it looked like uh, before we initiated mowing um, and uh, and so we did and this is a vegetation management technique that's based on repeated cutting and what if you think about plant energy reserves energy reserves now here we are in you know September there, we're at the end of the growing season the energy reserves in the plant are high right because it's had all summer to photosynthesize and, and store energy right when it starts to regrow in the spring that energy drops out until you reach a point of what's called full leaf expansion it's, it's, it's as much as it's going to grow that year and you're at a, a low point in the energy and then it starts I mean it's photosynthesizing the whole time but during this period the growth of the plant is great is using more energy than the photosynthesis is putting back into the plant so you're at a low point in photosynthesis and here we are you know May June sort of timing and uh, and so the idea is to catch it when it's low the energy reserves are low and just continue to cut it so that uh, that you can uh, reduce the energy reserves you don't let it photosynthesize and this works for any green plant you can you can kill any green plant by repeatedly cutting it um, things like knotweed and stuff like that works as well so there we are mowing yep yeah and Canada thistle um, I'm assuming you're talking about Canada thistle uh, is a is a tricky one because if you cut it once or twice you'll actually cause it to sucker up and, and spread and you'll get more of it so if you have thistle in a hay field for instance and you you uh, take two cuts off your hay field you'll get more thistle than if you if you don't cut it at all if you cut it ten times through the course of the summer every time it starts to, to come up you whack it again you'll kill it but if you only cut it once or twice through the growing season and this is one of the I mean you can see this if you drive on the highway between Hope and Vancouver in the center mid, uh, median of the highway there's thistle that is established because of the mowing regime that they uh, apply to that section of highway and so you know understanding the physiology the uh, the ecology of the uh, of the plants allows you to design a restoration uh, or management scenario that uh, that works quite well anyways that's what we're doing here and so that's what it's you know before mowing after mowing so this is um, after mowing so before mowing and then after mowing so in 2014 we probably had four or five different cuts flooded over the winter and in in the spring in 2015 the grass was coming back so we cut it again now we've gotten rid of all of the willows the willows are gone 
right? They haven't come back. We just have reed canary grass. They're short. They're called tall woolly heads, but they're actually only about that tall. <laughs> it's a misnomer. Yeah, and we also wait till after they flower. And so we're spreading seeds when we cut them. They're annuals. So, you know, we have a rare species biologist that works with us. So we're careful about that. So over the course of the summer and then back into the winter again, the flooding. So that's just as the uh, as the water is receding, you start to see the bare areas. And so this year we went back in and, and did a very careful analysis of where the tall woolly heads were. And so now we've got quite large areas of tall woolly heads. You can see them all there. Very rewarding when you can uh, actually treat a site and bring back a plant that's on the brink of extinction or local extirpation and uh, get it back to some semblance of working well. We had a kids build a tree, a tree for it in that tree and broke the branch down. I think it must have been pretty exciting when they were in their tree fort and the branch below them broke. But anyways, we had to get rid of the, uh, the branch and uh, mowed it. So that, that's what it looked like a couple of weeks ago when our most recent mowing without the branch there and stuff. Yeah, we will keep mowing as long as the reed canary grass is there. We're also getting, uh, because we opened it up to flooding, we're getting yellow flag iris coming in as little seedlings. Pardon? We're, we're depleting it, depleting the energy reserves in the root systems because, um, let me go back. Okay, that's what it looked like before we cut it. And you can see it's, there's not, the grass is, you know, it's maybe six inches, eight inches high. Um, and, uh, and so we cut it again and, uh, you know, um, it, it grows back very slowly. So eventually we'll get rid of it. Hopefully the, uh, the flooding and stuff this winter will knock it back again. I hope that it'll be gone this year, which will be two years of, of constant treatment, but I don't know that. <laughs> um, and reed canary grass is, is a tricky one. Um, the, uh, the, um, there are two major techniques for getting rid of reed canary grass. This mowing technique works well in a small area like the area that we're treating. Uh, but if you have large areas like we have in the reservoir here, you can't think about mowing that. It's just not going to happen, right? And so you have to think about other techniques. Well, reed canary grass is not, um, doesn't survive in the shade. So if you go out to this site here in Burton and you walk from the, reed, the dense reed canary grass in the open into the uh, cottonwood forests, even the ones on the little knolls, you know, the little knolls out there, um, you will find that the level of reed canary grass drops right off as you walk into that knoll. So the, the theory for getting rid of reed canary grass in the reservoir is to make knolls and hollows, and the hollows being uh, too wet for the reed canary grass and the knolls being too shady for the reed canary grass. If you wanted to really get rid of it all, probably, probably you wouldn't because it's just too much effort. But uh, Well, 
Well, the problem the problem is is that reed reed canary grass creates biological deserts. It's not used by birds. It's not used by a whole bunch of critters. Um, and yes, it's green, um, but it there's a lot more that we can do with the reservoir in terms of biodiversity than reed canary grass. So that's why you're going to get rid of it. Right. And so, so what you need to do is you need to change the conditions, which is what I'll talk about, but uh, change the conditions for, uh, for other things to grow. And you water it, and you fertilize it, and you do all these. Well, some people do. Some people do. And uh, and you know, if you um, if you provide artificial stimulants to the plants to grow, they'll grow, especially grass, because it grass has an intercalary meristem. That is, a, a, it grows from the bottom up. Most plants grow from the top up, right? So trees grow from the top up. But grass grows from the bottom up, and that's because it evolved with grazing animals, you know, prehistoric bison or whatever. No, seriously. And, uh, and so that's um, why grass works as a lawn species. But if you didn't, if you just kept cutting it and you didn't ever fertilize it or water it, you would so soon not have much of a lawn left. Because again, you're taking out the energy, especially if you cut it close. So what about soil bioengineering as a treatment for eroding shorelines, for instance? Um, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, that's useful to think about is how erosion processes in reservoirs operate. So wave erosion. Wave erosion is a fairly complex factor um, with the energy of the waves coming in and crashing on the shores and stuff like that. It's fairly high energy. Uh, but what stops wave erosion, you know, and you can see these sorts of situations. This happens to be Marsh Lake, which is a reservoir on the Yukon River. Um, and you can see the riprap here actually caused the erosion there by deflecting the energy. But, you know, if you look at the, how natural processes prevent erosion, you can see this emergent aquatic vegetation, um, in this case, uh, scurpus. Um, but look at the intensity of the waves there compared to there. You see that? Right? So that the energy in the waves is taken out by waving, by the waving grasses. That energy is transferred. And so you can actually get a shoreline protection with dense stands, in this case willow, but this is in the Yukon, um, you know, so at various water levels. I don't know of any place that has various water levels. Do you? <laughs> no, seriously, there are plants that are designed to, to deal with these sorts of things. Yeah. One of the one of the 
basic tenets of soil bioengineering is that you have to provide a system that's strong enough to w resist the um, degrading forces before it actually grows. And so if you're building, uh, you know, the picture I showed earlier was of a wattle fence. You're building a wattle fence. It has to hold up the slope before it grows. And then once it grows, you know, you're away to the races. It just gets stronger. So here you have to, um, what was that? I don't know where that came from. That looks good. Oh. <laughs> You're taking over, Virgil. <laughs> so even something as innocuous as the, uh, the pond lilies can actually help damp the vegetation, but you see, all this woody vegetation before you actually get to the uplands. And, uh, and that all damps the waves and controls things. This was a project we did in Regina. Um, and uh, basically using emergent aquatic vegetation to control shorelines. Um, so we actually collected the cattails from ditches around the city of Regina, just went around the city and there were cattails growing in the ditch, so we'd go and grab them, right? Because they were just going to be cleaned out anyways. And, uh, and planted them along the shore. And eventually, we had this whole shoreline covered with cattails preventing erosion of the shoreline. This is in Wabamum Lake by Edmonton. And you can see they've got a, a nasty problem with erosion. But if you go and look at this patch of willows, right, you find, hey, that's not eroding. We were actually there during a storm. And, you know, you can see the, the shoreline is getting totally beat up because the grass doesn't have enough strength to pre prevent it. And the, the waves are crashing in and just totally ripping the place apart. But you go to that patch of willows, and not only is it protecting the shoreline in terms of, of root systems and stuff like that, but it's damping the waves so that the waves, the wave energy is gone. It's, it's gone into the the movement of the, of the willows and stuff like that. So if you wanted to protect shorelines on reservoirs, you can create uh, dense willow uh, beds. This is a technique that uh, um, I developed to deal with uh, sediment transfer. And, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, you look at a ditch like this, what's going to happen when it starts raining? Well. You know, now it's raining, and we've got sediment washing into a wetland. The bunch of sediment control systems. Is this, is this a good one? Effective? How about something like this? Is it effective for sediment to control? Or this? You know, are these effective strategies? No, of course not. So this is a high-tech solution, uh, basically called live silt fencing. And you, you're basically putting in rows of cuttings to slow the flow velocity of the water. If you slow down the water, you take the energy out of it, the silt drops out, and you get a, a willowy wetland, which is exactly what you need to, uh, to control the erosion. So you can tell it's a high-tech solution because of the uh, tools the guys are using. This actually happens to be on the Vancouver Island Gas Pipeline just above the Qualicum River hatchery. So sediment was an issue. So you, you can see the uh, rows of cuttings. 
they grow. And in the winter time, you get these areas that act as, as little settling ponds, right? So there's the, the pipeline. Eventually, it turns into a willowy wetland with skunk cabbage and all the normal, normal wetland species. And uh, so if you're going to control sediment, what's better than a, than a nice little wetland? And you can use this technique in a variety of situations. This happens to be a blueberry farm in the Fraser Valley. Fish bearing stream just on the other side of that berm there. We talked about how we were going to fix it. DFO had some concerns about, you know, how are you going to control erosion with a couple of little willow sticks? Well, they slow the flow velocity and that controls the erosion. And it does that even before they grow, right? So you're, you're actually controlling erosion from the day you put them in. And they grow up. Eventually, we've got cattails moving in. So now we've got, you know, I mean, we've got wetlands forming, right? This is probably the wetland that the guy cleared to build his blueberry patch. It, it, yeah, the, the, uh, on agricultural land, you have to deal with nutrients. And uh, um, usually what we look at for, for nutrient capture is more herbaceous type vegetation. So the cattails are, are really good for nutrient capture. And probably the reason they showed up there was because of the high nutrients. So yeah, it helps reduce nutrients. Uh, apparently that doesn't happen. Apparently that doesn't happen. That's a um, that's a fallacy that uh, that um, people that demand that their ditches be clear and the water be flow, you know, watching it flow, uh, tend to uh, to look at and say, okay, I need to keep my ditch clear. But in fact, the water will flow even with willow sticks in it. So. It, 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 Yeah, and and you have a and you have a, a willowy wetland, which was exactly what was there before. He he dug the ditch through it. So. And you can use this same principle on any size of of site. So, for instance, this is a little uh, um, stream bank that a developer disturbed. <coughs> Got a bunch of cuttings, stuff them in, and when I'm talking about dense live staking, this is the sort of densities I'm talking about. You know, 20 to 30 centimeters apart, 15 to 20 centimeters apart. They're close, but if you go walk through a, a willowy riparian zone, which I was doing actually this past Saturday, doing an RAR for a developer. Um, and and it was so dense, you just have to battle your way through. You're, they're, you know, 20 to 30,000 stems per hectare, so very high numbers. So that grows up. Yeah. Yeah. Willows, red osier dogwood, and balsam poplar all will do that root from cuttings. And similarly, they will continue to grow even when their stems are buried. And it's an adaptation that these species have developed for growing in riparian zones. So, 
Not that I found. I Yeah, but there's probably a soil underneath. If you dig around underneath the rocks, you'll probably find that there's soil underneath there. And so if you get a two meter cutting and you get a meter in the ground, which is not easy, but it can be done, a meter in the ground will probably grow. Mm-hmm. Rough and loose, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got a two-meter long cutting, so you know I'm about two meters tall, um, and half it in the ground. <laughs> they're actually they're actually our planting bars. I'm, I'm teaching a course, a restoration course, where we will actually go out up in Revelstoke in October, where we will actually go out and fix some sites, and we will have fun playing with uh, with planting bars and and these tools that you can use to get cuttings in the ground. It's in October with the, Can the uh, Columbia Mountain Institute. It's I don't know. Pardon? No, it's a, it's a course I'm putting on with them. Yeah, yeah, totally. Although I don't know, it's maybe filling up, so it's so sold out. Actually, I think I I'm going to get uh, um, an assistant, so I think we can increase the numbers. There you go. Anyways, it grows up into, you know, a willowy riparian zone, and uh, and that protects the bank from erosion. So, one of the things that uh, that um, we found is that oftentimes um, uh, recreation Recreationalists with uh, with quads roar around on sites that you just as soon have protected. Um, this happens to be uh, Mount Tuam on Salt Spring Island with the Salt Spring Island Conservancy. Um, they are having problems with compaction and erosion. They they bought or were given a piece of forestry land that was Texada Logging's land, and Texada realized they were never going to be able to log again on. Salt Spring Island, <laughs> and so, so they got rid of the land, and uh, but they left this legacy of of old roads, and you will see the same legacy here in the Kootenays as well. You look around at, at the roads, and, and you'll see exactly the same thing, and so you wonder about um, things like hydraulic integrity and stuff like that. See. What would normally happen in a forest is rainwater soaks into the ground and runs in the ground as, as near surface groundwater, right? You get a road like this, it intercepts the, uh, the um, near surface groundwater and channelizes it down to the creek where there was a bridge or whatever. It channels it off to the, into the creek and all of a sudden you get very flashy flows during the rainfall events and virtually nothing during the dry season because you've short-circuited the, uh, the hydrology. Anyways, it's a, it's a very common problem and uh, um, where I live in the Cowichan Valley, we're currently experiencing a, uh, a problem with a lack of uh, moisture at the end of the, of the uh, growing season. And uh, so at this time of year, um, just when the salmon are trying to come back up the river, we've got no water for them. So it's a, it's a challenge. And that's because of this, right?
Yeah, that's that's to try and get the water off the road so that they uh, they can continue to use the road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What what you really need to do, um, in terms of getting the the water back into the groundwater system, which is what you what needs to happen, is uh, we had a bunch of problems. You can see the little wetland here, stuff. We made the whole thing rough and loose, and you know, so you can see how nobody's going to be running their quad across that. It just totally prevents it, right? Although we said we were doing it for hydraulic integrity, right? We weren't specifically stopping the four-wheel drivers, but. Uh, <laughs> and and you do the you know you you loosen up the whole road and it doesn't take long it's very quick lots of new seedlings so again just like the Heber Dam you don't need to do any planting although I think they uh, invited the Boy Scouts out to uh, yeah they had. Boy Scouts out putting in trees, you know, in the Trees for Canada. So we actually, as I said, closed off a wetland, prevented the mud bogging that had been going on, and we created habitat for this little guy, right? So you look at these sorts of, uh, of treatments in terms of, of the benefits to the ecology of the area. So as Virgil mentioned, a bunch of live staking was done. Success was marginal. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But if we look at natural systems where the water goes up and down, and beaver dams are one of them, what we see is the impacts of anoxia. That is, the lack of oxygen kills the plants, you know. So, you know, these trees were growing in the beaver dam and now they're dead because of anoxia. So, but, you know, if we look at the, uh, the uh, lodges and the dams, we sometimes see willows and stuff growing out of them. So maybe we could pretend we're beavers and build mounds. Right? which is what Virgil t talked about. But what about eroding shorelines? How can we deal with that? So you look at something like this, and you say, okay, how can I deal with that? Right, or this. So you could use dense live staking all through here, get a very dense riparian cover, and that would solve that problem. This is on the Campbell Reservoir. Interestingly enough, they used to operate that reservoir a lot higher than they currently do. There was a, you know, the former high water mark was way back here. And so all of this vegetation has established naturally. So if you go in and crawl around, you can actually see the old driftwood from the former high water mark in among the alder. And so you get, you know, all, even the fancy species start to show up. None of these were planted, right? So pioneering species are starting to establish, and these will protect the shoreline against erosion and, uh, and wave damage. Pioneering species foster the development of the conifers that will eventually come in. And so, of course, bedrock shorelines are, are fine. 
but you know in this case the parks branch cleared the uh, the riparian vegetation to make a channel down to the lake and uh, actually slowed the uh, recovery so where there's healthy riparian vegetation shorelines are good but if you go here where there isn't a lack there's a lack of riparian vegetation then you end up with problems and so you look at a site like this and you say okay what is the what's missing here well it's the riparian vegetation that's missing so you replace the riparian vegetation dense live staking there and you solve that problem very simple <laughs> it, if you if you dig down in the soils around here you will find it's wet um, I actually uh, did an assessment of smelter impacted lands in Anaconda Montana a couple of months ago I'm looking at it relative to a project I'm doing in trail and uh, one of the things I wanted to determine was if there was enough moisture in the soils for willows to grow. So Anaconda, Montana is, you know, it's on the dry side of the mountains. It's you know, not as, it's more dry than it is here. Um, anyways, there was, uh, there was, you know, you dig down and six to eight inches below the surface, there's lots of moisture in the soil. So I would bet if you go to the shoreline here, even you know at this time of year, and you dig down, you might have to go more than six inches. I don't know, um, but there will be it'll be dry, or, or it'll be wet, not dripping wet, but moist, moist enough for vegetation to grow. One of the beauties, of course, of natural riparian vegetation and the natural processes that allow it to grow is that it's adapted to varying water levels. So we look at natural processes for um, restoration of riparian zones. And you can see how that can how that can happen. So it's a it's an there's an interesting challenge, in, and uh, one of the things that you can look at is both physical and biological processes. So um, I, I include both of those in natural processes. So there are physical processes, as happens to be in the bridge system, a little wet area, Carpenter Reservoir, I think, that's the name of it, um, eroding. There's biological processes, so suckering of, of uh, balsam poplar, <coughs> which is exactly what's happening down here. So sediment dynamics. So here we've got sediment burying stumps. So obviously sediment is depositing in these areas. If you look at things like longshore drift, right, you get areas and this is the case on the ocean where there was a boat ramp that was preventing the movement of sediment along the beach. So sediment that is coming from those cliffs there is being deposited on the up, upstream. I mean, it's an ocean, so it's not flowing, but the longshore drift is moving the sediment towards me, taking the picture, right? So you get the deposition zone, and the longshore drift is taking the sediment away from this area. Um, and that happens in reservoirs too. We get deposition zones through the fine textured sediment, and we get erosion zones, right? See, of course, textured sediment. So what can we do to prevent, promote sediment capture? Well, we can create some heterogeneity in the reservoir bottom. So just this little uh, rock groin, you know, it took me 10 minutes to build, 
um, will start creating a, a tail of sediment behind it, which will allow vegetation to establish. So, you know, you can get the plants growing. So you look at look at the suckering of the balsam poplar here. Even in really harsh conditions, they start the uh, successional process that allows the conifers to establish. So what can we do with reservoirs? Well, reservoirs combine both the physical and biological processes. So we've got, you know, the physical process of that stump collecting sediment and the biological process of the plants taking advantage of the sediment to get established. So the problem is, is that uh, most of the uh, biology is submerged during the growing season. So it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, useful to think about how we can use natural processes to solve uh, reservoir problems. So you look at the live, tall live staking. You look at where you've got areas of uniformity, and this is in the upper Carpenter Reservoir. Um, not unlike the uh, the reed canary grass here, but you could make, see how uniform and lack of diversity that is? If you make it lumpy, if you take the, the sod and you scrape it off with an excavator and make a pile of it, you've got a mound and you've got a bare area beside it. And that creates conditions that would foster the development of, of a diversity of vegetation. So you use bands of woody species. I wanted to uh, just show you an example of how you can use live staking for, uh, for um, establishing vegetation. And this happens to be a, a gas plant up by Edmonton. I was asked to restore it, and that's what it looked like when I was asked to restore it. So I said, make it rough and loose. So we made it rough and loose, stuffed in a bunch of, see, these are two meter cuttings. They're putting them in a meter, fenced to control herbivory, which is a, a biological filter. So that was in 2010, right? This is September 2015. So we're six growing seasons later, and we've got, you know, that's my pocket knife, you know, so. <laughs> and, you know, so that's what we've got for six years of growth. And it's basically a forest. So by thinking about natural processes and how natural processes have, since time immemorial, restored disturbed sites, you can develop effective strategies for reservoirs. One of the uh, other treatments that I wanted to talk about was how you can use plants to change the physical conditions in which they're growing. So say a dense riparian zone on the on the reservoir a shoreline could actually change the conditions of that shoreline relative to the to the uh, plants that are growing there. And this is just showing how willows establish on gravel bars. And you get the willows established and eventually you get in this case, alder. This happens to be um, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And you've got conifers coming in underneath, right? So they start the successional processes. This is on the Porcupine River up by Old Crow in the North Yukon. And you can see clump of willow, collection of sediment behind it, right? And the reason for that is that that clump of willow slows the flow velocity of the of the river as it's as it's flowing by, um, and of course, most of the sediment in a river is carried as bed load, 
So just above the uh, the um, bottom of the river, and uh, it gets dropped out. So we can do that same technique um, called live gravel bar staking. We can actually create um, cuttings, you know, putting cuttings in the river. The reason you use an excavator to, to do this is because if you've ever tried to dig in a gravel bar, not a pleasant situation. So you use an excavator and it goes quite, quite quickly. This is on the Octomanch River, which is a tributary of the Gold River on Vancouver Island. But, uh, you know, we're shoving in cuttings. It's actually a hydrologist from Northwest Hydraulics, Ken Root. Um, I would say a man outstanding in his field, but that would be a poor joke. They grow. They collect finer sediments, so you can see the finer sediments starting to collect. Provide a snack for the Roosevelt elk. They uh, are persisting despite the heavy browsing and capturing sediment. So if you go to the San Juan River, this is a, uh, a project I did during the FRBC days, uh, forest renewal days. We had millions of tons of sediment moving down the San Juan River and going to bury the, the uh, chum spawning habitat at the mouth of the river. And people were saying, oh, well, how are we going to deal with this? You know, we go in and scalp the gravel bars. You know, we're talking about millions of tons. It's a lot of, a lot of material to move. And so I, I said, well, how about if we just create conditions to capture the gravel where it sits higher in the river? So we actually staked 10 hectares of gravel bars in the, in the San Juan, right? And uh, you can see that tree there. They grow, right? They collect small woody debris and sediment. The first year, we actually collected 80 centimeters of sand on and sediment on over 10 hectares of gravel bar staking. Think how many tons that is. You know, it's a lot. And then when there's still enough little, there are little bits sticking out at the top, and they grow, right? So that you get the whole process repeating itself. And over the years, you know, all sorts of things show up. This happens to be a big uh, Sitka spruce log that showed up. We start to get successional development. forest species moving in, including things like western red cedar. Look at the shape of that now. So that's the same tree on the far bank. But, you know, it used to be this big, broad, flat gravel bar. Now it's a raised gravel bar with a deep thaw wag and uh, created great habitat for fish. We've got uh, all sorts of other species moving in, so we got alder stuff. The whole gravel bar is infused with roots because you know it built up. Every, you know, every step has got roots in it. We did another, I don't know, half a dozen hectares of gravel bar this past summer. So that's what we were looking at, how we were, where we we're going to do it and stuff. This was the area that we staked. And Sitka spruce. So, you know, what, what, what it's doing is from a, a flat gravel bar, we actually started the successional process, and now we're going to get you know, those great big Sitka spruce that grow on gravel bars in the west coast of Vancouver Island. That's what that baby is. 
eventually we get the sediment laden water because only the very top part of the flood floods into the forest. That deposits nutrient rich sediments. Just remember the salmon that live in these rivers, salmon die in these rivers, the nutrients from the salmon provide nutrients for the forest. And uh, so you can use these sorts of things um, in terms of, of designing restoration programs for all sorts of different situations. So here we are on Salt Spring Island. And a couple of things that you can see here. That one of the things that we're doing is dense live staking at the toe of the slope on the street. It's an eroding slope, right? So very, very dense live staking. And the reason for that is this is on the outside bend. So it's where the water is carving hard against the, uh, the bank. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these willows to slow flow velocities, as well as the uh, live bank protection, the wattle fences on the slope there. So very, uh, very simple but very powerful techniques. And got a crew, happy crew. One of the things that I found over the years, and I think that it's something that's um, probably going to be important in terms of, of reservoir restoration, is to work with local stewardship groups to do the restoration work. Because there's a, a lot of, um, I don't know how else to say it, but a lot of joy in connecting with uh, healing the land, as it were. And so, um, you know, these people have worked hard all day, but they're all smiling. They're all happy, right? They've had a great day. And they've got another day, smaller slope. So we added live stakes at the bottom. Um, but see the leaf litter? That is designed to control raindrop erosion. Again, another natural process. So how does how is raindrop erosion controlled in deciduous forests? With leaf litter. Um, it also brings in, by collecting the leaf litter in the adjacent forest, we're bringing in the soil mycorrhizal components that occur in that forest onto the restoration site. So both of those are natural processes. So there's the crew at the end of the second day. So we can look at the conditions that foster growth in the reservoir. So what are the conditions that allow the sedges to establish, right, and recreate those conditions? Don't try and plant the sedges, but create the conditions that allow those sedges to plant themselves. So what are the conditions that promote sediment capture? So if we understand how these things work, we can develop strategies to restore reservoirs, basically. We'll leave it there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of herbiv herbivore pressures. You saw, the, you saw the metal fence on the uh, Salt Spring Island project. That was beavers. They're controlling beavers. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, uh, there's two theories about beavers. One is that, uh, that you try and fence them out, and the other is you provide so much that they can't get them ev everything. So. They did it on the coast, too.
But the other thing is, is that we're not um, turning over the solutions to people that talk a language we don't understand. We can understand how this works, right? Mm -hmm. Often what? Uh, weeds are, are, you know, sometimes a problem. Um, you can I actually teach a whole course, and I have taught taught for CMI. A course on called an ecological approach to vegetation management, and if you take what I've been talking about here about using vegetation and understanding the processes and stuff like that for revegetating a site using natural processes, if you take that and you flip it inside out in a way, you can actually design a system that controls uh, invasive species. So. Um, Interestingly, um, I worked for a number of years on with CP Rail on the development of a vegetation management system for a railroad that had 20,000 miles of track. So, you know, system-wide. Um, and one of the things that I found was that the traditional treatments that were um, being used to control the weeds, that is the use of herbicides and some pretty pretty heavy-duty herbicides on railroad tracks because they didn't want any weeds, right? Um, so they, they were non-selective residual herbicides was the way they were described. Things like tebuthyron, bromacil, diuron, chlorsulfuron, um, pretty heavy-duty stuff. Um, but uh, Basically, what I found was that the more those herbicides were used, the more the right-of-way got very weedy because those, the, and I actually did a study of the chemistry of uh, chemical migration from the center of track out to the fence line, found that we had ballast section herbicides right out at the fence line. So these were the herbicides that were sprayed on the tracks, right, the ballast section is 12 feet. Um, and uh, and went right out to the uh, to the fence. They were disturbing the vegetation. It wasn't it wasn't uh, um, high enough concentration to actually kill the vegetation on the right of way, but it affected it. So we were actually getting very weedy right of ways. And one of the things that um, was interesting because I uh, um, I was asked to uh, to develop a vegetation. We're still okay, right? few minutes. Uh, I was asked to develop a vegetation management system for the railroad, and the first thing I did was I said, well, what, what do we have? What, do we, what, you know, like Virgil talked about mapping the reservoirs, you have to know what you're trying to deal with before you can develop any sort of a management strategy. So we hired a bunch of university students, senior university students, biology students, to go out and sample on 20,000 miles of track every five miles sampled the vegetation. We sampled the, the um, ballast section vegetation, and we sampled the right-of-way vegetation. So what was growing there? And what we found was that, um, and, and if you go and look at, say, go up to the mainline track up in Salmon Arm or whatever, and, or Revelstoke, and have a look at the vegetation, what you see is that along the tracks, it'll get, it's, you go from the, the outside, which is vir virtually unweedy, and the closer you get to the, tra the, center, the center line of track, the weedier it gets. And so I actually developed a system of using high temperature steam to kill the weeds on the track without impacting right-of-way vegetation. Um, unfortunately, it worked too well, and the chemical companies leaned on the railroads to get rid of the idea, so it's not gone anywhere. But, you know, it, uh, and you can, you can think about vegetation management as you're um, dealing with the restoration program. So for instance, here at the uh, um, Burton Flats, 
uh, where we're looking at, you know, some sort of uh, scenario. You want to create a condition that prevents the reed canary, you know, strip the reed canary grass off and then prevent it from reoccurring. And you can do that by dense live staking and creating shade. And you can you can go out right now and look at the under the under the balsam poplar trees. There's virtually no reed canary grass, whereas 10 feet away, out in the open, there's lots of reed canary grass. That's shade um, or successional advancement the technical term for it. So, you know, by by incorporating not only the uh, the um, initiative of the restoration program, but also the vegetation management program in in your your treatments, you can design treatments that actually accomplish both. So it's a it's it's a, a very interesting subject actually. Any other questions or everybody's ready for coffee?